It's up to deck. How you doing, guys? <laughs> Thank you. watching a film but then all of a sudden we're in a film. Roughly 5,000 metres above sea level. To give you an idea, that's about 700 metres on top of Kilimanjaro. Grease is still going. Okay, well, listen, my name's Sam Malikam, and I consider myself to be an incredibly lucky guy. Um, why? Well, I've spent much of my life traveling the world in various different ways. I've cycled, I've hitchhiked, I've backpacked, sailed a bit, etc. But uh, my biggest trip was an eight year motorcycle journey around the world. Now, I'm in part lucky because I was sitting there in the pub and I suddenly realized, hang on a minute, you've got no responsibilities and no, no debt. And the luck is actually recognizing that and then deciding to do something about it. Well, I decided to ride a motorcycle the length of Africa. I passed my motorcycle test in six weeks and then three, six weeks later, I was sitting at the edge of the Sahara Desert looking south and thinking, Sam, you idiot, what are you doing? But what a fantastic year going down through Africa. Um, during that time, I realised what a wonderful way motorcycling is to explore. Just the opportunity to take all of the side turnings and what a different set of challenges there is when you travel by motorcycle. And one of the things that I loved was the fact that motorcycling is such an icebreaker. So many conversations started. So over that year going down through Africa, in spite of being thrown in jail and catching malaria and a 17 bone fracture accident and a few other mishaps, I had an absolute ball. And I decided that I wasn't going to travel, I wasn't going to go home, which was the original plan. So put me on the bike on a container ship and headed across to Australia and spent the next three years traveling through Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, Asia and the Middle East. And during that time, I met Birgit, who you saw ducking in and out of the screen earlier on. She's my iTech guy, or IT guy on this side. Um, and we traveled together through Southern Africa and South and Central America and then up through uh, North America together and um, what a lucky guy I am from there to to have such a fantastic person uh, to travel with now, During this time I wrote a few magazine articles and the idea being that I wanted to share the fun of the road and When I got back from the trip um, The editor of the magazine uh, got in touch and he said Sam so many people are writing and saying they like your articles And they want to know when your books coming out. Well, my attitude was well, what book that never occurred to me to do it but a new world of possibilities opened up for me because my attitude was same as when you're on the road if you don't try you don't find out and now I spend a lot of time bouncing around doing um, presentations um, spend most of my life trying to encourage other people to think actually if an idiot like Sam could do this then so can I and um, yeah so that's what I'm up to now okay fantastic hopefully I can stop sharing that okay Hopefully I'm back. Excellent. Okay, well, um, I've, I've had the great pleasure of knowing Sam for, for quite a few years now. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, always fascinating to hear kind of more. And, and the more I talk to you, Sam, the more I find out about the trips and, and, and there's always something new to, to you know, kind of hear about what you've done. Um, but let me start with just a kind of a really basic question. I'm sure it's one of the first ones that almost everybody thinks about when they're going to go off and, and do any kind of adventure is what made you choose your particular bike. So tell us what made you choose it and tell us a little bit about your bike. All right. Well, I ended up on a BMW R80 GS and we've got to be thinking that this is 1992. So this was cutting edge technology at the time. Now, I didn't have any friends who were motorcyclists. And back then, of course, there was no Internet and, and so on. And occasionally a magazine would write an article about somebody who'd done a bit of traveling, had done some long distance touring, as it was called then. But there was very little information around um, for the likes of me. I just wasn't tapped into the scene, what scene there was. So um, I was scrabbling around trying to work out what on earth I, I was going to take. And I was sitting in the, in the pub with my friends and um, they were just cracked up laughing because, of course, they thought I was completely barking mad, um, especially as I, they knew that I was only just passing my bike test. But uh, there were a couple of guys sitting on the table next door to us. And um, after a while, I mean, we were being loud. We were, lots of beer was flowing and lots of banter. But after a while, one of the guys leant across and he said, well, come on, Sam, you've got to choose the bike. Which one are you going to choose? And I said, you know, I just I haven't got a clue. 
they all look good. And this blue one looks quite nice. And of course, these two guys just rolled their eyeballs then. And this guy said to me, look, Sam, take a BMW R80 GS, it's bulletproof. His mate then leant round and said, yeah, blum, an idiot proof and all. And I thought, yeah, that sounds like the kind of bike that I need. And so began a fantastic relationship. Um, she has 278,000 miles on her now. But I need to do a little bit of a thank you there because there are certain guys around the world who have um, laid their hands on Libby and kept her going for me. So that's Bob. Mark, Dave and John, you guys are absolutely brilliant and Libby wouldn't have all of those miles on her now had it not been for you guys because I am a mechanical idiot. Well, I was. <laughs> yes, I, I think I've, I've seen plenty of pictures of you with your, your biking bits and your arms covered in oil and yeah, you, you, you know your way around your motorbike now. No, it's all I, fake, it's all fake. I've got Birgit who's actually swapping in to do all of the real technical work. <laughs> but, how reliable, I mean, you've done 298,000 miles, was it? Or yeah. Quick? yeah. So as, as it's a bike you obviously love because you still have it, but as a, as a kind of reliable machine, was it a reliable bike to have to go around the world on? She's been absolutely fantastic. Those two guys in the pub, they were so right. Um, I didn't re rebuild the gearbox until 250,000 miles. And when you think about... Uh, how many desert tr tracks and dirt roads and muddy sections and all of these sorts of things that I would have, I, I mean, the clutch alone. Um, I remember um, in the first couple of months coming down in through Africa in Ethiopia, and um, I was invited to put my bike inside a hut. Well, because they have um, pretty torrential rains in the rainy season, um, they have a, a doorstep that's about six inches to stop the rain coming into the, into the hut. And as I was trying to get my bike over this six inch doorstep, I mean, I'd only been riding a bike for a few months by this time. I'd never clue. I could smell this really bad burning smell. I had no idea that it was the clutch I was having a good old go at. But yeah, no, it was, it was fantastic. And she's had um, the usual bits and pieces, um, cables and so on. And um, when I got to the end of the trip, then we did the valves and um, those sorts of things. But mostly she's original and there are parts of the bike that have never been opened because well, they haven't needed to be. So she's a class act. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, so moving on from kind of your bike to actually where you went. So you said in your introduction that you, you started uh, in Africa, then you went to uh, New Zealand, Australia, the Far East, and then, and then Americas. But what made you choose the routes and the places that you went to? What made you choose those particular places? Well, Africa, I know you could have done most of the world, but in you know, the order you did it in. Africa was a no-brainer. I was born in Africa and lived there until I was 10 years old. And I wanted to go there first because, A, I didn't know any better, um, and B, because I wanted to find out whether my childhood memories were, were true. You know how things sound and how they smell. And Africa has a particular set of scents. So I wanted to find out. And yeah, my memory was spot on. For example, um, when you get to the end of the, the dry season in Africa and the first big rains start, and you go from um, parts of Africa which are just dried up and shriveled and dusty and into a world that suddenly blossoms with flowers and so on. And the smell that goes with this is absolutely wonderful. So that trip down through Africa um, really fulfilled those memories. And um, when I got down towards the bottom, I was supposed to go home. I was supposed to find a new career and um, head back again. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, actually, this is brilliant fun. And there is no good reason to go home, but there are lots of good reasons to keep going. So what are you going to do? So I got my atlas out and um, had a little bit of a, a hunt through it. And I thought, actually, Australia would be good. So I booked m myself a, um, a passage for me and my bike on a container ship and over across to Australia we went. Now, obviously, the, the logic there was either go up and across Asia or head across to the United States. But after being in Australia, I was in, I'd enjoyed being in um, developed world, but it was time for more developing world. And um, I'd never been to Southeast Asia before. I had been to India a couple of times. I'd walked a lot there and, um, and hitchhiked a bit and that sort of thing. So I wanted to go back with my own transport. And so the plan was made, um, Asia next. Now, during the time I was in New Zealand, I met Birgit and um, she was riding a bicycle there for six months and we kind of clicked. And uh, I said to her, look, why don't you come on the back of my bike for a little while in um, India and Nepal? 
and uh, we'll see whether we actually do like each other and whether we can travel together or not. We got on like a house on fire. So at the end of that three months, I said, well, look, I'm going to South America next. And it was just a dream that I had. South America, the Andes and so on, all of the cultures there are there. I wanted to see this part of the world. So I said to Birgit, look, um, would you like to come with me? And she said, well, yeah, but on two conditions. I want to go to Africa first. I thought, yeah, okay. I don't mind going back to Africa. There's a lot I haven't seen and there are some great places I'd like to show you. Um, and the other condition was I want to have my own bike. As we rolled out of the port in Mombasa, she'd been riding a motorcycle for just 600 miles. Mm. Really amazing lass. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I'm going to try, I mean, I've got so many questions that I want to ask you, but I'm going to try and see if I can um, go to some of the questions that are coming up from our audience. Uh, and there are so many. So everybody, uh, I wish I could ask all the questions, but there's just no way I'm going to be able to get through all of them because there's so many. Um, but here's one. So this is from Philip Corpus, and forgive me, Philip, if I've got your name pronounced wrongly. But he says, um, hi, Sam, what are the three most essential non-mechanical accessories you would carry on your trips? Hello, Philip. Gosh, um, non-mechanical. I think it's really important that you have a decent tent, um, a three season tent, because then you're able to cope with pretty much whatever the weather throws at you. And that tent has to have certain things. Now, for me, it has to have two entrances because that way you can get a, a through breeze when it's really hot. Um, mosquito netting on both of those entrances. Um, it has to have a, a sewn in ground sheet so that, uh, you know, a bathtub ground sheet so that um, even when it's really hissing down with rain and mucky out there, um, you're pretty much covered. If you can find a nice thermic tent, which has um, got a, a reflective liner to the, to the fly sheet, then that's even better still, because when it's baking hot, you can turn it inside out and reflect a lot of the heat away. The next thing is uh, a decent sleeping bag. I made the mistake with this in the first year. I set off with a two season sleeping bag and there were large chunks of Africa that I was flipping freezing. It really wasn't a good decision. So three season sleeping bag at least. I mean, you can lie on top of it if it's too hot to be inside it. And you can just pull a corner over you just to add that little bit of warmth in those early hours. And the other thing is a decent sleeping mat, something that will um, go down really small. I use a three quarter length Thermarest because it packs away tiny um, to a really small size. I don't need a full size one because my bike jacket is going to go under my feet, so that cuts down the amount of space. But you know, one of my mottos is if you can eat well and you can sleep well, then you can travel with a smile because you're ready to deal with whatever the road's going to throw at you. Okay, yeah, and, and, that, and that's great advice. Um, okay, so we've had a couple of questions about. Um, about the bike and kind of and to do with budget, but um, kind of I'm rolling a couple of questions into one here, which is um, somebody has asked, would you, this was Keith Thompson, would you trust a new GS for the riding you've done? And then somebody else has asked, this was um, Ride with Ren, if you were starting from scratch today with an equivalent budget, like when you started, what bike would you choose? So there's kind of, would you trust a, a GS you know, the, of the latest generation and then if you were starting from scratch now, what bike would you choose? Um, gosh, you guys have put me on the fence. <laughs> I, I like the new GSs and you hear an awful lot of negative comments about them. And that's purely and simply because we've got the facility to share the information, but we hear very, very little about the thousands and thousands of bikes that nothing goes wrong with. So um, I've never ridden a 1200 GS. I've never ridden an 1150 GS because I know that if I do, I'm going to want one and I can't afford one. So, um, yeah. Um, would I? Well, yeah, of course. Why not? You, every bike that you go traveling with is going to have its different set of issues. I happen to like carbureted bikes, but I have now got an F800 GS, which I keep in the United States for traveling over there. And of course, that's fuel injection. Now, for me, this is learning something new. If I was going back to the time where I was first looking at the bikes and um, would there be something else that I would choose? No, no, I wouldn't. Uh, Libby has been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, okay, for about 5% of the trip, but she was horrible. She was a pig to ride. You know, really soft sand and, and thick mud, fall off all of the time. Just, just absolutely horrible. But a good 80% of the time, she's been absolutely fantastic. And the rest of the time, she's been competent. So, yeah. Um, 
she had she's heavy in comparison to some of the other bikes that were around at the time so for example the dr 650s um, i might have been tempted by one of those okay okay so great answer um <clears throat> okay so coming coming back to, to your trip as opposed to answering some of the questions from our audience how did you fund it you were you were away for a long time you were away set, was it seven years in total uh, eight and a half in the end okay so yeah eight and a half so how did, how did you deal with money how did you fund yourself okay i come back from other trips um broke and i promised myself that i wasn't going to do this i realized how lucky it was age 34 to be suddenly free of responsibility and i thought you may never be this free again so i decided to sell everything i got sell my house car furniture clothes anything i could sell i sold even down to going onto the street and um selling my my business ties by by the tie to to, to people passing by and you know 10 pence for a tie that 10 pence that was a loaf of bread in africa perfect that'll do nicely that's mm. not my priority and the idea was that uh, if i got halfway down um africa and i really wasn't enjoying what i was doing because i didn't even know if I liked riding a motorcycle as I was traveling across Europe um, the bike was telling me what to do I was just hanging on not trying not to fall off um, but uh, the idea was that you know if I got halfway down Africa and I wasn't enjoying well I could go home I'd hardly spent any money by that time and I'd still have all the money in the bank so I could start off again but um, of course halfway down Africa I'm smiling and I'm having a ball and when I get to the bottom of Africa I'm just I'm not going home now, for the rest of the trip, um, I'd, I'd already learned how to live cheaply from previous trips. I don't need um, a lot of the, the whistles and flutes of travel. I drink hardly any beer because that's a budget breaker. For example, in some countries in Africa and South America, one beer is the equivalent of um, a couple of meals at least in the day and food was more important. Um, I bush camped as much as I could, um, stayed in really cheap local hotels. I traded um, work for somewhere to stay and, and a meal quite often. So I wasn't actually spending the money that I'd got. And the other thing is travel, travel slowly. There are so many advantages to traveling slowly. You're just not sucking fuel as you might be. You're not breaking your bike as, as often as you, as you might be if you're traveling at a greater speed. So, um, Travelling on, on a tight budget is really um, a lot easier than people think, but you've got to slow down and you've got mm. to be laterally thinking and, and trading what you've got for what other people need. And quite often that just comes down to labour. Um, I came back from the trip still with two grand because I promised myself I wouldn't come back broke. I wanted to be able to have some beers with my friends and I wanted to have the deposit to go down on a flat. I mm. wanted to be able to buy some clothes to go for a job interview and all of those sorts of things. I'd come back from one trip heavily in debt and it took me a year of hard graft to pay that off. And for me, I didn't want to do that again. Mm. Okay. And <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've asked you this question a number of occasions when we've done this kind of thing before, but you, know, you were away for a long time. You went almost, almost everywhere. Um, <laughs> no, I'm still working at it. <laughs> but where, where, do you have um, a favorite moment or a favorite thing or a favorite yeah a favorite moment a favorite thing that happened um and then after that the opposite what was kind of the worst thing that, that happened i'm gonna make burgett blush and she's in the other room watching this but i think favorite moment was the day that i realized what a phenomenal woman she is and what a great traveling companion she is and how much she added to my life by saying yes to come and travel with me i got lump in the throat saying that silly boy um worst moment accident in malawi and ending up in jail um that was that, in fact the, the hair on my arms is still has just risen up that's still the scariest moment of life favorite place there are too many to mention this world is just full of fantastic places but if i have to nail it down to a few then lake bunyoni in southern uganda monument valley the blue mountains in australia um, the the gravel roads in namibia and so i could go on um, incredible the most challenging moment i think that was after having been medevaced back from um chile um, i really badly damaged my back and um my insurance company flew a doctor and nurse out um, to, to fly me back. And um, when I got back to the UK, they told me that um, there was a chance that I wouldn't walk again if I had an operation. And, um, and they also told me that there was absolutely no way that I'd ever um, ride a motorcycle again. Well, 
yeah. yeah, that was all a bit gobsmacking because you know we was we were down in Chile. We'd only just got <clears> to <throat> South America in real terms, but. Um, yeah, three months of, of I chose the physiotherapy and positive thinking option and three months later we were flying back to Chile and um, starting all over again. Birgit was phenomenally patient, um, the medics and everybody else, um, I can't tell you how much um, I owe them because yeah, we set off gently again and the trip carried on and um, it just goes to show, you know, just because you're told that you can't do something doesn't mean that there's not a way that you can do the same thing but differently. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so somebody else had asked a, um, a question about your writing, and I had a question along those lines as well. So in your introduction, you said the writing started, you didn't intend to write about your trips, uh, and it started because you wrote a few articles for magazines. So had you been a writer in any shape or form beforehand? And then no. somebody else actually asked a question about, um, let me just make sure I got this right, how did you develop into the fantastic author that you are now? That was from Billy Fisher. Wow. So, yeah, had you, had you written before? And then how have you become this amazing writer? No, I'd never written. Um, I got the gr worst grade in uh, English language in school that you can get and still pass. Uh, on my last day at school, my English teacher poked me in the chest and told me I was a bit of a lost cause. At the time, I was very disappointed, but I knew she was right. But with hindsight, I knew that she was actually setting me a challenge. She was, she was telling me, um, you can do better. And um, the magazine articles, they were really where it all started off. Um, I got stuck on a camping site in Delhi and um, three months trying to get a visa to get through Iran. At the time, Maggie Thatcher had managed to annoy the Iranians, so they weren't giving um, visas to Brits very easily. But um, this was a real crossroads for um, overlanders. And um, what, you, know, you sit around swapping stories and um, picking people's brains and all this sort of stuff. It's a wonderful thing to do. But, uh, one night, one of the girls said to me, Sam, you should write some articles. So many mad things happen to you. And I thought, well, why not? It's that old thing. If you don't try, you don't find out if you can. And um, so I had a go and a magazine, Motorcycle Sport and Leisure in the UK took them and they said, well, keep sending. And when I got back to the UK at the end of the trip, um, the editor, Peter Henshaw, got in touch and he said, Sam, we're getting letters and emails from people saying they like your articles and they want to know when your book's coming out. Well, I was just gobsmacked. What book? Um, but I thought, well, look, you know, if you don't try, then you'll never find if you can out if you can. So I sat down and um, we were working, renovating semi-derelict houses during the daytime. And um, in the evenings, I was trying to write. And I decided that I was going to write about the things that I found interesting in books and that I thought other people would be interested in about our journey. So not about me, me, me all of the time, but about the places, the people relationships. Other presenters so far on, on the show have already talked about that. Um, it's the people that so often make a journey, but also the quirky things about the history and the geography of the places. And so the motorcycle became the thread. And yeah, I'm really lucky. People seem to like what I've been doing. So um, yeah, I'm delighted. And thank you, Billy, for that comment. That's really nice. Cheers. <laughs> and so, I mean, you've been to so many places. Are there any places that are still on your, or, or what places, I'm sure there are, what places are still on your list of places that you'd want to go to? I would like to go up the east side of South America. I'd like to ride down the west side of um, Africa. That was the original journey, but um, just as I passed my bike test, so six weeks into the planning stage, everything went pear-shaped in Algeria and all the borders in um, West Africa closed down. Nobody had any idea when they were going to open. And that was how I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. Let's try going down the east side. And at that time, I didn't know that nobody had done it for 20 years because of various civil wars that were going on. But I was lucky and got a window of opportunity. And I was also lucky because I met up with a couple called Mike and Sally, and they were absolutely fantastic, and we travelled together. Um, and now I've lost the plot because I've forgotten what the question was. Oh, yes, places to go to. <laughs> much more in the United States that I want to travel um, and explore and see. Um, this world is just fantastic. And that's why I do the presentations and the magazine articles, because I want people to get out and see it for themselves and also to learn what they're able to do as, as individuals. We can all do more than we think. Cool. Lovely stuff. So that was obviously uh, Sam Manicum with uh, Graham Hoskins from Adventure Bike TV. Um, mm. Love that Q&A, mate. It's always a pleasure to have Sam and to have him on our, on our own forum, I guess. The Armchair Adventure Festival was a real pleasure. Um, mm. Did you enjoy it? 
did, mate. Always enjoy hearing Sam's stories. He's full of them. So much adventure there. And great, you know, that Graham was able to come on, do the interview. I'd like to hear more of Graham's adventures in the future as well, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Really nice stuff. And it was nice for us to have a rest, wasn't it, really, mate? And everyone really to have a rest from us. I yeah, mean, exactly. Yeah. I think before we get sick and tired of us by that point. So to have someone like Graham very kindly come on and do a cracking job of playing host for a bit. Yeah, it was good. I, mm. I also thought so. So, and, yeah, uh, not too bad. Um, who have we got next, mate? Who's next? Next week is going to be the land, sea and petrol panel. So three top adventurers from different kinds of adventure um, mm. discuss the ins and outs of adventure uh, in their in their sector, if you like. So it could be land, which was Ollie Hunter Smart walking on land. Mm -hmm. C, uh, Natalia Cohen, yeah. uh, part of the first all female team to row the Pacific, or um, Petrol, Tiffany Coates, world's most foremost female adventure rider, three hundred thousand miles around the world on a motorbike, something like that. So been to all kinds of places on motorbikes so the land sea and petrol panel so many tips between them we really get into it over about 30 40 minutes and great little session i think mate yeah no i agree i, I thoroughly enjoyed it i thoroughly enjoyed it obviously mate you are a petrol adventurer if you had to choose between one of the three if you're going to switch what would you switch to um you know, I'd like to have a go at the old ocean rowing thing, but I think it would just get too much. So I'd go with Ollie Hunter Smart's land, walking around. Interesting. Or, or something else on land. Yeah. You, you need armbands as well, don't you? Well, I can swim, actually, mate. I'm fine. I'm not worried about the water at all. But, yeah. but, the, but it, I think, have you seen the blisters and stuff they get? Yeah, and all the, the salts and how it affects you and stuff? If you watch a road from independence, mate, the blisters that Ollie had in his feet were pretty nasty buggers. Thing is, though, mate, Ollie can just go, God, his blisters are in. I'll stop doing this for a while. Or whatever. <laughs> Natalia <laughs> and, the, and the team have to go, right, let's crack on. Well, they could, mate. They could just stop, but they might end up somewhere they hadn't planned. In the ocean, mate. That's not what you want to do out there. No. Not as easy as that. Yeah, fair. Well, that's right, guys. Yeah, so that's um, coming up next week, um, which will be a, a call. Obviously, you can catch it right now if you want to head over to the old Patreon page. Um, we're releasing the content mm -hmm. from the Armchair Adventure Festival a week in advance. If you are super keen run a bean, you can head over there. Um, <laughs> How many run of beans have we got now, mate? Uh, 11? 14. 14, 14, 14 run of beans over the on the Patreon page there. And the reason is for that, guys, it's only a dollar a month. Yeah. So back, you get a backstage pass for a dollar a month. Mm -hmm. Backstage pass plus, you get a mention here mm -hmm. um, on social media, and that's $3 a month. And then $5 a month, you can, get, you can be a producer. And then, of course, that golden ticket, $25 a month, yeah. you become a festival director. Yeah. Um, pretty remarkable stuff. You do find some interesting stuff as well, like we are going to release them very soon the first few speakers for the next Armchair Adventure Festival, uh, mm. the winter edition, if you like. And we're also going to be, no doubt, um, yeah, putting other bits and pieces on there as well. So, Don't mum's the word, mate. So you, you gotta be, you got to be in it, be in the know. If you want to be in the know, you've got to pay a dollar a month, and that's all we'll say about it. So that's it for this week. The Land, Sea and Petrol panel coming up next week. It's non-stop Armchair Adventure content, mate. Non stop. Non stop. See you then. Do 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 do. <laughs>